Greetings, and welcome to the Signal Watch Halloween. In this season of chills and thrills, we're watching Keystone Films from two studios who didn't just make their monsters part of cinema history, but released films that wove their characters into the nightmares and popular imagination of the last 90 years. Join us in a Halloween spooktacular as we talk the classic monster movies of Universal and Hammer Studios. Enter the crypt, and each week we'll uncover the most iconic characters of horror cinema. So let's talk about the monsters that make Halloween good, creepy fun. To a new world of gods and monsters. Happy Halloween, and welcome back to The Signal Watch. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Steens, and with me today is... Simon Day, hello again. And uh, this week, we're doing mummies. Mummies. A couple of mummies. Mummies, no, no daddies. The sequel is daddies. Um, so we got The Mummy, the original 1932, with Boris Karloff, the ever-present uh, Boris Karloff. And then we have The Hammer Mummy, also called Just The Mummy, from 1959 with the great Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee again, going head to head. So it's really interesting to me. I, I was online uh, about a week ago and in Egypt, they were opening, opening a sarcophagus and, you know, their national geographic or somebody was like, you know, trying to push like, you know, attention to this event. Um, and of course everyone was saying that, no, no, we don't need any curses in 2020, you know, and it was a sinister guy in a fez in the background. <laughs> well, so here's, the, get, get here's the funny thing is like, I think, in, and I talked to someone online who's who, highly educated, very intelligent person. And she had never heard that there were mummy movies before the 1999 Brendan Fraser one. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's, it's really crazy. And, you know, mummies appear in like the credits of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> um, like they're, they're just kind of ubiquitous in like Halloween decorations. Um, next phone's probably had a mummy story. Okay. Sure. And they, the, anyway, but they, you know, and there were so many mummy movies. There were, there were so many of them that universal made based on the strength of the 32 mummy movie. And there were lots of ripoffs of it. You know, there's like the Aztec mummy mm -hmm. and stuff like that, um, that went on for decades. They also had stuff like the Monster Squad. So I feel like, yeah, Mummy's always turned up every decade some, somewhere, really. Yeah. So I, I, I find it fascinating that despite kind of what I think of as being this kind of like cultural ubiquity of this kind of thing, and everyone should know like Boris Karloff played which roles, you know, these sorts of things, which clearly I'm living in a little bubble. Um <laughs> But people, people, you know, of a certain generation just never got exposed, particularly, it seems, to this, the, this character or these characters. I think we're hitting a millennial wall where people are starting to not know who Paul McCartney is, and we're kind of crying over that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, it's just fascinating how this stuff just starts to kind of filter out or... or um, doesn't get enough uptake, you know, over the years. They know they can probably tell you the name of all three witches in Hocus Pocus, but you know they have <laughs> no idea who freaking Boris Karloff is, which is just a fascinating uh, cultural phenomenon. Well, it's also kind of interesting because, like you say, these both had a bunch of sequels. Um, 
Although, interestingly, um, I don't think any of the sequels necessarily carried on from the original films in story or characters. But, um, but also, you know, the Hammer Ones was another go around for, for Lee and Cushing um, together again after Dracula and Frankenstein. And the Universal one, you know, you had Karloff playing another role after The Creature. And the Universal films in particular, I think, are very, um, um, very kind of incestuous, you know? They're like, um, everybody kind of has a go at playing everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you got Lon, Lon Chaney Jr., not just the Wolfman, he's also Dracula's son with his huge moustache. And, um, and, the, and the creature, the Frankenstein creature, Bela Lugosi gets to play Eagle and the, and the Frankenstein creature um, and Dracula and a dodgy, zip, and, and a dodgy uh, gypsy werewolf. Um, so, yeah, everybody is very promiscuous, you know? <laughs> I think that's a great way to put it. Um, so I, I saw this movie for the first time when I was kind of in college and, and going through and renting all the Universal Horror movies at uh, I Love Video, which was near my apartment at the time. Um, and that was a, a store that was in Austin, much beloved, uh, and now no longer with us, thanks to the power of COVID. Um, but it, uh, it, what struck me at that time when I was watching it is the biggest scare to me in the whole movie takes place in the first five minutes. Yeah. And it's the most low-key scare I can probably name in a movie, and then they kind of replicate it in the, se- in the not the sequel, but the Hammer movie of Karloff does nothing but open his eyes. Yeah, yeah. And well, actually, I thought, you were gonna say, I thought you were going to say the hand because oh. the guy's reaching the scroll and suddenly this hand just kind of reaches over. And I'm like, that's good. Because it's actually just cut to the mummy being totally still. Mm-hmm. He carries on reading the scroll. And it's a great setup. It's a great builder. Oh, yeah. And really, that's what I mean is that whole sequence is – like you could bottle that sequence and go, this is horror. Here you yeah. go. Um, Cause yeah. even, even to the point of the guy going mad at the end, like he, he's, you know, that's the result yeah. of what he's just born witness to. Um, Which they do, like you say, they totally rip off in the hammer one. They kind of basically replay that scene again. Um, but interestingly in the universal one. So I, I, I really enjoyed the hammer one. The universal one was a long hour to get through, I thought, partly because you've only got a mummy for the first five minutes. And then it's like an elderly Boris Karloff scowling in the fence for the rest of the film, which just doesn't do as much for me, I have to say. I'm a traditionalist when it comes to mummies. <laughs> so I, find, I, I agree. When I, you know, when, I, when I first would watch this movie, I, and, and it's weird to re-watch a movie over and over that you just don't love, right? And the first time I watched it, I was you know, like, okay, the big scares at the beginning, are they going to do that again? Wait, now he's just a dude in like a robe and a fez. Um, yeah. Since then, I've kind of come to appreciate more of the, he's the undead. He's kind of a like evil wizard. And yeah. he has a whole lot of really weird stuff going on, but he also has a bit of the sympathetic monster thing going on of, he is doing everything to just get back his love after 4,000 years. Um, oh, yeah. And it's, it's actually like you like you said, I think, about three podcasts ago, it's a total rip off of Dracula. Actually, kind of does it more than Dracula does, as in, this is my reincarnate, reincarnated love. And, you know, it's, it's almost like a tragic romance. Um, I also love, I know we're jumping massively ahead here, I also love the end of this and, and the end of the Hammer one for different reasons. But in both of them, especially in this one, the Karloff one, he's kind of screwed over by his, his old love because she's like, actually, I prefer the modern world. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go back there. You know, leave me alone. In fact, I'm going to like, you know, disintegrate you. And it's funny because watching it, I was like, um, that reminded me of The Mummy Returns with Brendan Fraser. And amid all the CGI effects that I vaguely remember it being, I remember the bit that really stood out for me was, I think at one point, Arnold Vuzlu, who's the mummy in it, he's kind of like basically his princess kind of double-crosses him or says she doesn't want to be with him. 
And I just remember this really pained look in his face as his whole world collapsed kind of around him. You know, it, it literally brought back the dead and these armies to like get her. And she was like, no. And I'm like, that's the best bit of the film. That's the bit of the film I remember. Yeah, no, I mean, and I think that's great stuff. What I would say is, so I think we we have this kind of memory of like Dracula having had this like reincarnated lover, which is interesting because that really only popped up in the Francis Ford Coppola version of Dracula. But then it seems to have kind of permeated the Dracula lore, but it's not in the 1931 Dracula. He's not talking about how Mina is his long lost love in that movie. I mean, she's not, she's his romance in it, but she's not like some reincarnated lover. And they, they seem to have borrowed that from the mummy. There's a lot of similarities between how, uh, Ardeth Bay is is coming for uh, Zeta Johan in this movie, but it's it's but there's yeah. none of the reincarnation bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm I'm the same as you. I'm not sure when that started. Maybe it's in the Frank Lagella seventies Dracula, mm, but that's possible. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's it seems to be kind of interchangeable. They kind of did it for the Mummy, and maybe they went, oh, that that works quite well for Dracula as well. They start sticking it in there, really. Yeah, and I don't I don't mind it in the Dracula thing. It just makes so much more sense in the context of um, you know, them worried about what's going on in the afterlife and kind of concepts of reincarnation, all of that that's much more baked into the mummy lore, like re- like real world mummy lore than than it seems to be um uh, baked into Dracula, which is just kind of this undead sort of thing. And oh, by the way, we're also going to, you know, throw on top of that uh, you know that you, you can be reincarnated too. Uh, but apparently, apparently there was a lot of subplot cut out of this that they did film, where you saw you saw her reincarnated through the years in different situations, and uh, there's actually like a credit for um, Saxon Warrior for Henry Victor. and he's quite prominent in the credits, but his part was totally cut out because I guess that was one of these kind of flashbacks to her previous lives. Which is interesting. So I, I want to take it past the movies themselves and talk a bit about, um, uh, you know, 1922 uh, King Tut is dug up yeah. and uh, Carter Howard uh, d- does, you know, his scene there. And then you get kind of the, the guy who was funding that whole thing, um, he dies abruptly in the desert. He gets blood poisoning and just dies in Egypt. Um, and then, you know, various other things happened and there's considered to be this kind of curse of King Tut's tomb. Somebody can't find their car keys. And- right. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this kind of, you know, both this interest in Egyptology, which was kind of bubbling, you know, in the, in the teens and twenties. And I looked it up. I was like, well, when did Egyptology really start? And the answer is Egyptology has kind of always been with us. Um, yeah. Even like during the crusades, apparently people would sometimes swing down to Egypt to check out the Sphinx on their way over, you know, to go fight in the crusades. Um, mm. And it was really kind of the, um, you know, 1800 or so that, you know, kind of these gentlemen scholars started kind of turning it into a quote unquote science, you know, realizing, Oh, well, we need to document all of this. And then the Rosetta stone and all of that kind of made everything explode. Um, Mm. It was definitely kind of this gentlemanly pursuit. Uh, There was also kind of the raiding of Africa by Europe, you know, that was going on in, in multiple, multiple ways at that time. And Egypt, because of its kind of like biblical ties and all of that had these, um, you know, a lot more interest from Europe and then kind of, you know, of course, then the huge edifices and, and all these sorts of things. So there was just so much for them to kind of come down and be interested in. And then, you know, the King Tut thing, you know, the most intact tomb anyone's ever seen tied to kind of this interesting quote unquote curse. Um, and 10 years later, well, you got this movie. Well, both, both of these films also seem to like lay a lot of blame with the British Museum. <laughs> who, uh, who apparently, yeah, has turned up into just like trash places and steal everything and um, to kind of deserve everything they get, really. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a thread. And if you were remaking this now, either as a period piece or remaking it, you know, just to make it as a straight film, I think that's definitely an angle you'd want to take. 
um, of kind of like, what does it mean to go in and start, you know, raiding tombs? It doesn't need to necessarily be in Egypt uh, and it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, the British museum. Um, I mean, I've been there, so I know, man, they've got a lot of stuff from all over the world, but so do, so do (laughs) museums in Chicago and, you know, all all those sorts of places. So, you know, there's a bit of anti-imperialism in there, I think. And it's also, um, it's interesting because I feel, especially in the hammer one that has the, um, the Egyptian guy who kind of controls the mummy, um, camping out in an English mansion it kind of had echoes of the devil rides out where it's like, you know, there's this shifty foreigner in our, in our midst <laughs> who's kind of been messing with us, you know, uh, it's quite, quite, quite amusing. Yeah. I definitely thought about that a bit of like, if you were going to remake that one, how, how would you do it now? So you wouldn't, you know, get run over by the PC police. Um, yeah. but it, uh, anyway, I find it interesting. The other thing I'll throw in there, cause this is, we talk about comic books from time to time. Uh, there was a huge impact from this movie on comic books in general and Egyptology had kind of at the time uh, there's at least three major superheroes between Hawkman, Dr. Fate and Metamorpho that all have ties to Egypt um, and in kind of this era uh, in particular, uh, what I found interesting to loop it back to the movie is uh, one, the character's name is uh, the, Hawkman's name is Carter Hall, which is clearly a play on Howard or Carter Howard. Um, Mm. And then his whole origin now is that he keeps getting reincarnated from uh, the period, uh, the Egyptian period, which when they they talked about how, Oh, well this was originally the story of the mummy. And I was like, man, I bet, I bet this is where they got that idea. I bet someone watched oh, the yeah. extras on the DVD and was like, we need to do that with Hawkman. They've never used that before. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. And as, um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the, the 1932 mummy, I like, I liked it in the fact that it explained a lot, but it was incredibly talky and there wasn't much action. Um, there wasn't even really many deaths, you know? Um, Mm-mm. I just felt like it was almost like, and then suddenly like the last minute it went absolutely nuts. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I'm like, you really could have stretched that out. Cause like so much happened in the last minute. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when I watch it now, I'm, I'm really watching it for kind of what's happening with uh, ZD Johan's character. Um, and, She's got and a very of... big head. I think <laughs> she kind of looks like, she looks like Betty Boo. I was going to say, yeah, she looks to me like a Disney princess. She has these gigantic eyes and kind of this very round face with this kind of crown of hair around it on this very slender frame. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, she's, uh, and you know, I was watching the extras on the Blu-ray and they were, they were talking about, you know, kind of who she was. And all I knew was she'd only done a few movies and they had no real love for Hollywood. Apparently she was a yeah. big stage actress in the 1920s. And kind of after her stint in Hollywood, uh, did more of like teaching acting. Um, and apparently mm. it was like a part of like the whole like early 20th century spiritualist movement and like mm. thought that she should summon her characters to her. And so it would like almost <laughs> do like a seance of like, okay, you know, I'm playing uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt is now inhabiting me, you know, instead of like, Okay, yeah. how would Eleanor Roosevelt be? It's like, no, I'm going to magically summon my character, which I find fascinating. It also ties in sure very closely was, with all this. I was, yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure that was great promotion for the movie. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, we got to remember, this is like actually a made up monster as well, because although the Toon and Carmen stuff was going on at the time, unlike Dracula or Frankenstein or The Phantom of the Opera, there, there was no source novel. This was. Um, Cole Army Jr. again saying, write me an Egyptian themed horror. And then I think again, it was John L. Boulderston who'd done Dracula and Frankenstein. Um, basically just kind of making stuff up a little bit, you know, throwing in a bit of Tutankhamun. Also a bit of Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, Ring of Thought is in there, I think. Oh my God. And uh, oh, right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, cause actually it's very similar to Dracula, you know, even starting with Swan Lake again, I was like, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it, it definitely has tone. We already talked about some of the similarities, but it definitely, uh, 
seems to have lifted a lot of the, you know, sort of Mina Dracula sort of relationship right out of there. Yeah, and we had uh, Jack Pierce doing the makeup again. Um, he's, get, he's got his spirit gun out again. Um, and he's prepared to use it. And uh, especially at the start of the film, actually. And right. um, uh, Carl Frond, it was his first American film uh, directing, but I think he'd done loads of cinematography. He was the cinematographer on Dracula. And he was kind of one of those guys who kind of went back to being mainly a cinematographer after this. I think he ended up on I Love Lucy, funny enough. But, um, Bizarre. but he, you know, he actually makes it look really good. I think it's actually shot very well, you know? Yeah, it has some really, really good stuff in there. Um, it, you know, now it's passe to do what they were doing with uh, kind of all the, the shots of, of Karloff's face as he's like using his mind control powers and uh, you know, some <laughs> of that. But there's some really good stuff, like when he's in kind of his, his personal home um you know kind of how they move the camera around to to like go above his scrying pool and all this sort of stuff um uh, yeah it, it's it's a the camera work in it to me feels like it's a bit ahead of its time and some of the stuff has just been adapted better in the years since but this is kind of the first time you see it uh, between this and dracula i can not work out why he waits so long to, to tell them to dig up the tomb because like he obviously shuffles off at the start and I'm like, fair enough. He's got to, like, you know, buy a fez somewhere. Um, but then he waits 10 years to, like, come and say, oh, look, I've just found this bit of pottery and dig up over there. So, Yeah. Um, I mean, so I, I don't know. I mean, it, I could, <laughs> if I was going to posit my theory, you know, he's got to get established as Ardeth Bay. You know, he's got to figure out what's going on in the modern world. Uh, that's got to take mm. some time. And then he is, you know, it's a revenge story for him as well. So he's exploiting the son of the guy who, you know, raided the tomb uh, to begin with. Um, yeah. Well, they kind of, it's interesting how in this version, the universal one, I guess the assistant goes nuts. Um, who, who, first of all, I thought was the son, but he was the assistant. And then the son comes back later, who I guess was at school when this originally happened. You know, yeah. they, they kind of white up the dad's hair a bit to make him look older. Where it was in the hammer worn, the dad goes nuts and kind of Peter Cushing as the son kind of takes over. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there, I, I think I'll, it's interesting where the echoes are between the two and where they deviated and, and why. And I don't blame them for doing a lot of what they did. I mean, I, I think the, the 32 mummy kind of works in, in, in what it does. I don't know how actually scary it is. Um, and I, I think when they made some of the changes they made, and I'm not sure I'm buying that Cushing actually looks like he's young enough to be that guy's son. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the old Roger Moore in the, uh, his last couple of Bond trick of, if you get a really old henchman, it makes Roger Moore look slightly younger. <laughs> uh, but the the yeah, so we should talk definitely about the the fifty nine mummy. Um, I had only seen this once before about two years ago, uh, and, and was really pleased with it when I watched it. I, th I think it works really really well. Uh, I was the same. I mean, after after last week when we did the Phantom of the Operas, I was like, this is more like it. This is this is what I want. I want um, I want Peter Cushing who cleverly hurts his leg at the start. So because I'm like. You know, come on. We could all pretty much outrun a mummy, right? Um, but they give him a broken leg, so he's, he's, he slows him down a bit. I like it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it really does turn into this, like, uh, the, the revenge story becomes, you know, really into, into focus in this one. Um, you know, there you have this guy who was around trying to tell them not to dig up this tomb when they dug up this which they also make a, a real point of like, look, this was like a cult, a specific cult of Egyptians mm. and all kinds of crazy stuff went down, <laughs> you know, around this particular tomb. Um, we have a ground up Christopher Lee in flashback. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> holding I mean, his, I think that, holding his, uh, Go ahead. holding his big toothbrush and he's got like a hat on that looks like he's, he's stolen from a new order video. 
Um, I actually think the costumes and, and the, the makeup in this are, are pretty thoughtful. It looks like they actually spent some money on this one. Um, including it's, it's, done, it is, it's, it's, it's actually pretty good. It's done in a hammer way, which it's kind of funny. They don't have that many followers, <laughs> but um, it's done kind of well, actually. I agree with really. Yeah. So um, in this one, it deviates a bit. In the, in the original, uh, the princess had just kind of you know, gotten sick and died. And um, there was, uh, yeah, so he was, he was going to try and bring her back to life. And they, they echo all of those things, but they spend a lot more time showing it. And part of the horror of the 1959 version is also kind of showing like, look, this is kind of like, if you think about it, that a lot of this is like blood cult stuff. You know, we're, mm. when you think about like getting buried with all your servants, which they, you know, did in Egypt and they, you know, there's also Scandinavian uh, groups that did the same thing. Um, you know, you don't think about it a ton. You're like, yeah, that's a thing they did. But when they actually show it, you're like, man, that's, that's kind of crazy messed up to have like, you know, eight women just standing there ready to take a hatchet to the back of the head so they can, you know, join their queen in the afterworld and, and continue to serve her. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like very well done and it, it really moved again. I think this along with Curse of Frankenstein and Dracula, you can see why Hammer was so successful. And um, although it's got a few, I think the flashbacks do kind of kill it a little bit, slow it down. I mean, Lee is brilliant. He's actually, I think, more effective in this than he was as Frankenstein's creature. He's, he's kind of like the Terminator in bandages. Mm-hmm. You know, he'll just like come to a wall or he'll, uh, I love when he breaks into the prison cell. It's like terrifying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's like a really good scare. And when they get to the bit about the reincarnation of the of the princess or the whatever she was to him, it's um, it's done, you know, a little bit more subtly. He he, well, not subtly. He stumbles upon her and wasn't expecting to see a woman who looks just mm. like, and it just happens to be that she bears this resemblance. Which of course you can go, oh, of course, you know, she just happens to. But you're like. Yeah, but you know, we're talking, you know about Lucky. a world with magic mummies and stuff. Um, and she has to have her hair like down for him to recognize her, those sorts of things. I was going to say, I love how Peter Cushing goes, put your hair down, because he's a bit slow. It's like, <laughs> he's like, oh, now she looks like her. But, um, but no, it's kind of it's kind of great. And I love, I love, Christopher Lee does some great eye acting towards the end of this. Like, I love um, how the guy in the fairs, you know, the Egyptian who's controlling him, Basically goes killer, and you just see Christopher like narrowing his eyes, and <laughs> like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great to kind of see, you know, the you keep in mind that that mummy has motivations, and and seeing how that actually plays out with any dialogue, without any dialogue from it. But yeah, I mean, I died. Oh no, go on. Let's say Cushing. I thought was you know once again great in this. He is probably playing about. 10 years younger than he really is uh, in this role. <laughs> um, and he's also he's, got for England uh, a remarkably stocked gun cabinet, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not sure why, as like an Egyptologist, he would need all of that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. It's, it's, like it's like Donald Pleasance in the Halloween movies. Why, why does he carry a gun? He's a psychiatrist. <laughs> um. But yeah, I mean, it's it, it. They do have a do a good job of kind of setting up everything of of like even even you know oh the box fell into the swamp so you can get, at least get that cool shot of of you know well the that's where the mummy thinks he lives now is at you know the bottom of the swamp. Um, also, once again, I mean that's that's a, and that's great for the climax of the film as well. But once again, don't hire idiots to do your handiwork because uh, you know with their wagon, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Don't hire the drunkest guys you just found <laughs> to drive your precious car. Talking, talking about drunks, Michael Ripper turns up as the poacher in this again. He's not the barman. It's amazing. I, I guess. I guess like as he got older, maybe he just retired to the bar. But um, yeah, he's he's drunk drunk poacher in this. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's a, it's a really solid, you know movie with you know not you know you could show it to kids it, it's not going to traumatize anyone i don't think um but it's no. still got enough of yeah. enough scares like you talked about like him coming through the window and 
Um, and it, it doesn't have that very creaky, like, look, I'm watching this to appreciate it thing that you kind of have to get through with the 32 mummy. Um, it, it moves at a modern movies clip. Um, and, and, you know, the characters are all, you know, reasonably proactive and not making, you know, it just ridiculous decisions to keep the plot going along. Um, well, it's also, also interesting that the hammer one actually isn't a remake of the mummy, uh, the universal mummy. It's actually a, a kind of mashup of the mummy's hand, the mummy's tomb and the climax from the mummy's ghost, which went off the universal ones went off and actually started concentrating on Karis instead of, um, Imhotep. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's a really good point. Um, yeah, look, we talked about it in the 32 mummy. He, he only spends like five minutes in the bandages. And then after that, he's just a guy who's literally covered in dust or he's when you touch him, like parts of him are coming off sort of thing. Um, kind of grump, grumpy old man, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, he's still, you know, he's kind of this weird dark wizard guy, you know, sort of thing. And, but yeah, like you were saying, by the time you get to the next movies, they kind of realize like, look, people kind of were looking for more of the dude wrapped in bandages when they showed up for this thing. And so that's what they delivered. Um, and that's where hammer starts with their, their story is, is with the guy in the bandages. And they, uh, you, instead of having Ardeth Bay, um, you have, you have the uh, Egyptian fellow who's, who's, you know, trying to mastermind his revenge against the guys who raided his, you know, cults to And I, by the way, I love that scene where Cushing comes in to kind of, Say hello, welcome to the yeah. neighborhood. I think you're trying to kill me. Let me ask some probing questions. Well, he's basically trying to get a reaction, isn't he? So he's kind of winding him up, kind of mm. saying, like, well, you know, a lot of these religions are just followed by simple people, and just seeing how he reacts to it and stuff, it's kind of funny. Yeah, making some fun of like cl- clearly someone's, you know, if, if he's right about it, you know, someone's, you know, deity that they've, you know, given their whole life for is. Uh, yeah, that that's some kind of crazy stuff for you know, 1959. I mean, I, I so the, yeah, like we said, the sequels. So so Universal actually yeah cranked out quite a few sequels. A lot of them with um, I think at least three of them with Long Cheney Jr. Um, and whereas the Hammer ones were like a little bit more spaced out. We had Curse the Mummy in '64, The Mummy Shroud in '66, and um, and then Blood from the Mummy's Tomb in 1971, which had Valerie Leon in it, who was the receptionist in The Spy Who Loved Me, who she goes, um, right, right, right. Ro- Roger Moore, I've got a message for you. And he goes, I think you just delivered it. Um, <laughs> so with her, her pneumatic cleavage. Um, but actually in, in Blood from the Mummy's Tomb that she's in, she's the re- reincarn- reincarnated princess who actually starts murdering people. So again, that's a film without mummy, interestingly. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you're trying to start a new mummy franchise now, um, you know... Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise. Yeah, I can. (laughs) I I still haven't seen that one. I need to get around to it at some point just to see what they did. But um, yeah, I don't think you can start with, with the... Um, they're they're not wrapped in bandages. Like, and I, maybe that was part of why, you know, what, what happened at the mummy. But at the same time, you know, the 99 mummy, uh, that, that guy, I don't think is ever wrapped in bandages. He just kind of shows up, uh, you know, reintegrating yeah. himself bit by bit, right? He controls and he controls the sand. He controls the kind of, um, I guess, like dead things, dead skeletons, a bit like Jason and the Argonauts. Um, I mean, the Tom Cruise one I did see during the lockdown, and it wasn't a bad film. It just it just seemed unnecessary, really. Um, it kind of like, and it had the female mummy that was interesting. So it was a more more like a kind of evil princess. Um, I also sent you a link, I think, last week to a uh, "Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid" tell us the mummy, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I don't know if you got a chance to watch, but um, that's a bad film. But it's it kind of does something interesting in the mummy, as in it's just the bandages. The bandages are whipping around in very, very bad nineties CGI fashion, wrapping themselves around people and and hanging people and stuff. But it's a little bit different, at least. Yeah, I mean, I do appreciate what what is the guy's name? Stephen Summers or something like that, who did all those mummy movies. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah. I do appreciate that. Like he clearly got like, look, the 32 mummy, if that's what we're doing is he, it, you know, he goes for the evil wizard, you know, undead wizard thing and, and, and really just cranked it up to, you know, to 11. Um, yeah. And, you know, you could definitely have gone the way of the hammer mummy. Uh, people seem to not be, doing that you know right now between you know the the steven summers stuff and then the the tom cruise thing which i from the trailers look like she was another you know sort of wizard sort of person um yeah well it's also i think the problem with the mummy and frankenstein's creature is unless you're you, you purposely back into a corner you can quite easily get away from it i mean you know they get around that with zombies because there's a lot of zombies and they can kind of like, you know, they can mass, mass you and cut you off. But if there's this one thing, it's like, we'll just climb over the table, or, you know, <laughs> just like, just walk away. Walk away without looking. Um, yeah. So I think they also have to try to work away from that, which is why a lot of these CGI ones are kind of all over the place, really. Yeah, and you can't really do a, a you know, oh, well, there's just a mummy that springs to life out of its, you know, and comes out and murders people. Like that's not much of a story or movie. So I, I guess I appreciate that. Um, it's just kind of weird in comparison to kind of how you, in your head, you know, think of like mummies and the cartoon idea of a mummy that's kind of pervaded culture because despite the 99 mummy uh, and the 32 mummy, um, you know, that's, that's, that's certainly the image people seem to have. Yeah. And every time you find any mummy merchandise out there, I don't think I've ever seen anything that was Lon Chaney Jr. Or sorry, not Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, Boris Karloff in a in a fez and robe. Like it's always his, you know, that that the, the Jack Pierce makeup. Yeah, which is great makeup because I heard they kind of burned the bandages and put them in acid to make them look old. And um, and again, the makeup took like eight hours to put on him. Um, and it's a shame that's only at the start of the film. Because like you, like you said at the start of this, you know, I think him just opening his eyes is, like, great. Um, but, you know, but after that, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's just going to be like a kind of creepy old magician going now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I enjoy both of these films. Um, and, I, and we haven't... I, I think the, the, we talked a bit about Zita Johan. I don't think we've talked uh, at all about, I'm trying to remember her name. Well, Ed French? Van Sloan's back in there as well, isn't he? Oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, that guy was banking for a year or two yeah. in, in uh, Universal. He gets um, around a bit. He gets around as the, as the elderly uh, professional who knows everything. Yeah. And, and he does this thing that's like really particular uh, that, I, I just have really grown to love of when anyone else is talking, he just freezes <laughs> and often with his head kind of cocked as if he's like really listening intently. And it's interesting because he's a stage actor and stage acting changes, you know, it's just constantly like, you know, organically changing, but you know, surely that's what he was doing on stage as well during plays while people were giving, you know, speeches or whatever. But that was kind of his go-to move. He kind of does this weird thing with his hands where they kind of hover in front of him and his head kind of cocks. And he has kind of a slight smile on his face as they're talking. It's just the weirdest <laughs> little gesture. But, uh, yeah, he does it in this movie, too. He's probably thinking, what am I going to have for tea tonight when, I, when all this is over? <laughs> yeah, it's like, when they stop saying their words, I can say mine, and then I get to go have some tea. Yeah. <laughs> This is all a load of rubbish. I don't, I don't believe it was. Um, well, actually, um, actually, something I was going to mention was I got hats off to Terence Fisher, who I think has directed every Hammer film we've done a podcast on in the last three, four weeks. Um, so he was the go-to director at Hammer, especially in the early days, and um, did a great job. Um, also did The Devil Rides Out, I think. Did a couple more Draculas, um, a couple more Frankensteins. Island of Terror, which isn't Hammer, but I, I love it because if you, if you kind of like Doctor Who cross with Hammer, watch Island of Terror. It's uh, Peter Cushing fighting off silicon monsters that suck your bones out. Um, but then sadly, he kind of had a car crash at the end of the 60s. And that, that really, I think it, it was a bad one. And it took him a few years to recover from that. He kind of did come back and do a couple of films, but he was never the same. Um, 
But really, he was he was a major driving force um, in early Hammer Horror. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and in fact, I was watching of all movies on TCM this week, uh, Night of the Lep- Lepus, mm. uh, the giant rabbit <laughs> movie, which giant one rabbit. day we're gonna do because it's it's <laughs> a spiritual sister to Tarantula. It also takes place in Arizona, but with giant rabbits instead of tarantulas. And it so also, I'm surprised William Shatner is in the movie. He's not, but DeForest Kelly is. There you go. There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um janet lee oh yeah yeah i've forgotten so, that yeah yeah um oh so i did it, it i don't think she pops up in a lot else but uh in in the mummy the the kind of princess slash wife of peter cushing is uh, yvonne forno i can't speak french so i'm doing my best here she's gorgeous oh she? yeah yeah she is absolutely stunning she was kind of the perfect choice for that role um, but I don't know if she went on to go be in any other hammer. Uh, she was in stuff like the Dolce Vita. Um, she's in repulsion. Um, and, and, Oh, looks like she was in something in 1984 called Frankenstein's great aunt Tilly. So. <laughs> she, Doesn't sound too good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I know um, also, um, I mean, yeah, she, she's kind of great in it, but I, you kind of get the feeling they kind of like, imported it just for this film and then she probably went, happily went back to France I think yeah yeah I, I, I strongly suspect that was the case um, but I know, yeah she's, I know. she's a lot of fun in it yeah no she's great um, and you know and she, she kind of plays like she's, she's not just a scream queen in it as well she's actually like you know quite sensible and you know she actually saves Cushing I think a couple of times uh, when he's being strangled and stuff because she yeah. kind of she realizes what she needs to do to distract Lee. Um, but also I know, I know some stuff was edited out. A um, couple of, couple of little trivia facts. So Carr is having his tongue pulled out and the shotgun demise at the end, uh, which is probably the ropiest special effect, I think, because it's obviously a model was trimmed by the sensor. Um, also Peter Cushing did a lovely thing, which kind of sums up Peter Cushing. I think they showed him the poster, which, you know, Ham always used to, make the posters way before the films um, and quite often sell the films on the power of the poster. Um, but Cushing said, well, hang on, look, you know, in the poster, there's this big mummy, but it's got like a hole in the middle of it with light shining through. And that's not in the film. And Hamill went, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And Peter Cushing said, well, you know, the fans will be cheated. So he pushed for the scene where he actually shoves the spear through the mummy. Um, just to make the poster make sense. <laughs> okay. All right. That's cool. I mean, when I was looking at, I was looking at the poster after I finished watching the movie and I assume that was supposed to be the shotgun blast had gone through him to allow the light through. But uh, yes, there is of course the spear sequence that is actually pretty darn good. Um, yeah. I, it's weird to like a guy like Cushing is like kind of a scrappy action hero, but he kind of, he is again in this one. So well, okay. I've, said, I've, said, I've said this to you a million times before, but Peter Cushing is, Bill Paxton would say, the ultimate badass. I mean, forget your Bruce Willis's and your Schwarzenegger's. I mean, this guy has killed Dracula. He's killed mummies. He's basically chopped his arm off and survived. He's, he's stopped himself being vampirized by cauterizing the wound. Um, he's Darth Vader's boss. I mean, the list goes on, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, he's, he's great. And, and, you know, unfortunately you almost want to say like, well, he doesn't really have any scenes with Christopher Lee. He's like, he has tons of scenes with Christopher Lee. It's just that Christopher Lee's under so much makeup. Yeah. It's easy to, you, yeah. you don't get the, like the full, I've been watching all these Dracula movies and you don't get the full Christopher Lee necessarily. Um, but well, he's still, really have, he's still really good. Yeah. I don't really have any communication. I mean, even in Curse of Frankenstein, he's trying to communicate with him. Whereas, Christopher Lee just keeps bursting through the wall and trying to throttle him in the mummy, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, I love the set of kind of his library slash office that uh, he does burst through. That was well thought out for all the blocking and all of that. Um, you see those big glass windows down. and it almost has a like, well, if there's a gun in the first act and you know, <laughs> it's like, there's no way those windows are remaining intact by the end of this movie. 
I was surprised how quickly he fixed his window, though. <laughs> <laughs> Had some guys around really quickly. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, the, the climax of the Hamlin's great, you know, where he's like, you know, tell him to put you down and all that. And, it, you know, and you can kind of see Lee looking a bit sad about it. And it's, it's just really good, you know, as he sinks into the swamp. It's actually a bit terminated, too. <laughs> you know, you expect him to put his thumb up. <laughs> That can be helped for the remake. But yeah, so I thought a little bit about the remake. You know, how would you redo this one? And I think this one you could do mostly keeping it intact. Uh, I mean, you'd probably want to, you know, move the scale up of how big this cult was, you know, maybe shoot it outside instead of on a soundstage. And then I thought a lot about, you know, okay, well, it's, you know, as you said, the, the you know, the foreigner has shown up and he's brought evil with him. Um, it is not hard to imagine doing like, the crazy grad student who has this, you know, decided he's going to become a worshiper of Karnak or whatever. It'd be really easy to have that just be like, you know, someone who the person's known for a while and thus it's not a big deal that they're living down the street and, you know, has no idea that guy's brought the, you know, the mummy back to come murder him once he's learned how they, you know, um, you know, has decided he's turned on how they raided the tomb or whatever. Um, I, I, I would love to see, you know, Hammer kind of come back and, and try and redo these things because they're, they're kind of kicking around as a studio again. Um, yeah, yeah. And they, they kind of start off well, but I don't know. They seem to have gone a bit quiet again, um, which, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I guess I'm, you know, I obviously love Hammer, but it's, it's not the Hammer that, you know, was obviously because everybody's different and everybody's, you know, it's a different company. It's just got the same name. So it's not going to have the same work ethic necessarily. Um, and it's going to be very reliant on having a big success. Whereas, you know, back in the day, Hammer cranked out with four or five films a year. So it's never going to be like that again. Um, but it would be nice, like you say, seeing them do a modern version of Dracula or The Mummy or Frankenstein um, and see what they could do with it. Yeah, I felt like they were doing like ghost story type stuff when I when I heard they were coming back. All of which sounded kind of interesting, but honestly, I haven't seen any of it. So maybe maybe that's for a future podcast. Well, actually, weirdly, Universal, I guess, has kind of been a bit more successful with their their version of the Invisible Man this year, which they kind of like. I think they did with Bloomhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, low budget, interesting concepts, and uh, I really enjoyed it when I saw it. You know? I almost started watching it last night. Um, it's on HBO right now. And I, I yeah. happen to have HBO right now, um, but I did not. So I am, but I'm going to watch it here over the weekend is my plan. So yeah. I'll report out. And maybe next Halloween, we'll talk about the different invisible men's. Yeah. Yeah. Got uh, any, any excuse for me to watch Hollow Man again? <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, I, I really enjoyed. I, I enjoyed the Hammer one. I think. I think the Karloff, the Universe one, was a bit slow, but I kind of respected his talkiness. I think it was a good script. I just think it was lacking in action. Um, and then in the last thirty seconds, it kind of went bananas. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you should have taken about five minutes on that instead. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely for me, a step up from the Phantom of the Opera's episode. Yeah, um, I, I think that the. The the mummy from thirty two is definitely like advanced level monster appreciation, um, but yeah, definitely fifty nine mummy. You know, some some you could easily throw in for a great Halloween film any you know any any year with any audience. So. I think the thirty two mummy would have been vastly improved by more close ups of Boris Karloff's face. <laughs> just really just about forty five minutes of just right in there. <laughs> it's like more cowbells, you know. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, happy Halloween. Go tell your mummy you love her. Happy Halloween. Bye. Bye. Now, when he was a young man, he never thought he'd see people stand in line to see the boy king. Monkey! 
That about wraps it up for this edition of The Signal Watch, a production of the League of Melbotus. Thanks for sticking with us. If you enjoyed this podcast, we invite you to drop on by the Signal Watch blog where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more. You can drop comments on this podcast and let us know what you think. We do have a Signal Watch Patreon, and if you're so moved, we'd most certainly appreciate your support. We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind.